If you would stand with me, please, as I read from the 12th chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, my brother, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Father, it's a so sobering passage of Scripture, uh, at least in the sense that it reminds us of eternal things and of the, of the reality of eternity. So hard when we're young, uh, Lord, um, I think all of us who have reached that age in our 50s, 60s, whatever, would like to say, wow, if I could just know what I know now and be able to go back and live it over. And so we feel a, a great responsibility to try and pour into our young friends what it is that you've taught us because suddenly when we're within five or 10 or 15 years of eternity, it looks a lot closer than it did when we were 25. But the reality is, it's close for all of us. The reality is, in light of thousands and millions of years that we will live, this 20, even if 30, 40, 80 years will look very small. So Lord, give us your perspective and help us today, Father, as we look at this passage, we might understand it, that we might apply it in the ways that you see fit and that you want specifically in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Pretty, uh, pretty clear just from reading this passage that from God's perspective, life is very brief, right? Pretty temporary. The story was told of, an, of a 19th century, 1800s American who was visiting in Europe, and he came to the home of a, of a relatively famous rabbi at that time, a man named Hafez Chaim. Chaim. Try and get the Hebrew pronunciation there. He was, uh, he was quite famous at the time, but the man was astonished when he looked around the room, and all he saw was a single room, a lot of books, one table, one bench, that was it. And so he said to the rabbi, he said, Rabbi, where's all your furniture? And the rabbi looked at him and he said, well, where's yours? And he said, well, sir, I don't, I don't know if you understand. I'm from America. I'm just visiting here. I'm just passing through. And the rabbi said, so am I. I'm just passing through. So are we all. But most of the time, you'd never know it by watching our actions, would you? You'd never know it, that we're just passing through because we look like we're very entrenched. One of the things that grabs us is the idea that life is stuff. You know, it just, it just gets its hold on us. Life is stuff. Jesus begs to differ. Notice verse 15, where he says, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, the one who has the most toys at the end isn't the winner. In fact, may, in fact, be the loser. Life is not stuff. And so as we've looked at this, you know, very brief series, two sermon series titled Money Matters, verses 13 through 21, we get some insight from the Lord in how he looks at our possessions, how he looks at our things, and beyond that, really, to 
even relationships and other things that are of a temporary nature in this life. Five parts to this little vignette. We looked at the first two last week. First of all, the inquiry in verse 13, where this, where this man in the midst of Jesus talking about all of these eternal values, eternal truths, the need to have Christ as Savior and Lord, the need to not blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the need to uh, by, and commit an unpardonable sin by, thereby, the need to fear the Lord, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. I mean, heavy truth. Here's this guy saying, well, as soon as he can get a word in edgewise, teacher, teacher, uh, could, you, could you tell my brother to divide the inheritance? Such a foolish statement in the context in which it was issued. Was it important to get his inheritance? Perhaps, we don't really know, and I think that's because the Lord is saying whether he deserved it or whether he didn't is immaterial to the big picture. The big picture is eternity. And this man just wanted to use Jesus to get what he wanted. He didn't want to worship Jesus. Jesus was just a means to an end. He was looking at 20 or 30 years of existence and his whole life was revolving around that. And Jesus is trying to pull him back to reality. And the inquiry. Then we had the indictment. Jesus rebukes him for his short-sightedness. Basically, what Jesus says when he says, who made me an arbitrary judge over you? He's saying, he's saying, listen, young man, I didn't come to give you what you think will make your life. I came to be your life. And if I don't have that measure of importance to you, if I'm not playing that kind of part in your existence, then you have been extremely short-sighted. Need to get that all settled first. God invites us to enjoy the things he gives us, beloved, but only in the context of a position way below the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. So that brings us to the third point in this little passage, which is the instruction. And that's verse 15, the instruction. He said to them, take care and be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It's obviously, it's the key phrase in the passage, right? One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, life isn't stuff. Life isn't stuff. You treat it that way, but it's not. You're not living in reality when you're treating life as though the next thing you can get is the thing that's going to get you happiness. And so he says, guard, guard against covetousness. He's, say, he's making it our responsibility. This is for you to take on. And since we all, I, can, I think I can say this without fear of contradiction, we all live with a measure of covetousness. It may be a lot or it may not be as much, but we all have it. And Jesus is saying it's your responsibility under the power of the Holy Spirit to guard against that in your life. Make sure that's not the driving force. Now, the root, the root for the word covetousness is the word to have, to have. It's a logical question is what, to have what? And the answer is just to have. The heart of covetousness is the desire to have. It's the desire to have more of whatever it is that I don't have or to have more of whatever it is I do have, but I think just a little more would get me over the top. Covetousness, the desire to have. It's like, it's like a man. Think of a guy on a raft out in the middle of the ocean, right? And he's in desperate need of water. And what is there? There's water everywhere. So he takes a drink of that ocean water. But of course, the ocean water is filled with salt. And so every drink that he takes only increases his thirst. It only increases his desire and never satisfies it until he dies of his foolishness to take this thing that he thought was going to save his life. Covetousness is exactly like that. And somewhere in the midst of our lives, it all exists. This is why, 
This is why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, I think I gave you the wrong verse last week. I think I told you 5, 5, but if I did, it's actually 5, 10. Ecclesiastes 5, 10, where he says, concerning money, he says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Money can be a wonderful tool. Money can be a wonderful instrument for our own happiness and for helping others be happy, but can also be the thing that when we get wrapped around it becomes the thing that can never satisfy. It does not have the capability to satisfy. And the more you want it, the more you won't be satisfied. Now Paul tells us why that's true in Colossians 3, 5. Jesse hasn't taken us quite that far. So listen to this verse as I read it for you. Colossians 3, 5. Paul says, put to death. Notice again, this is a command to us. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Oh, that's tough, isn't it? If you just took that general comment, that's homework enough for a lifetime. Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. What he's letting us know there is the heart of covetousness is that it's idolatrous. It's no wonder it kills, right? Covetousness is an idol. Covetousness is an idol, something that we love more than God. And all, always, always, two things about idols that you can always count on. Idols always promise more than they can deliver. Always. And idols always eventually kill. They destroy. You live your life around an idol and it will eventually destroy you. Covetousness is a fool's game. Now listen, beloved, Jesus isn't telling us to make us unhappy. He's not telling us to make us feel guilty. Although if we have covetousness in our life, it ought to be convicting and it ought to cause us to want to go away and do what he says, be on guard against that. But he's telling us this because he wants us to live in reality. And reality is these things, these possessions, the things that you desire, the things you want, the things you think would be most things that, that, that would make you happy will never do that. That's what he's trying to get across. Covetousness is insidious. It's insidious. It's insidious because we don't see it in ourselves. We don't see it. We see it in others, but we don't see it in ourselves. St. Francis of Assisi said this. He says, men have confessed to me every known sin except the sin of covetousness. Nobody ever came to me and said, please, I'm covetousness. I'm, I'm coveting. Money sickness, possession sickness, things sickness hides inside of us. It's like a cancer. It's like those cancer cells that sit inside of your body. All of us have them. You never know when they're going to break out and strike and start to multiply and kill. But that's what covetousness is, is, is like. It's inside us. It's laying there. It's dormant for a while and then it strikes. So the Lord says, watch out. Be on your guard against all covetousness, send out, in other words, send out a seek and destroy mission, find it, get rid of it. So it's your responsibility. Did you ever notice Jesus never says, watch out for adultery? He never says that. Is that because adultery is less destructive than greed or covetousness? Of course not. Is he against adultery? Of course, he says so. But the reason he doesn't say really be on the lookout for it is because you don't, you don't have to be told when you're committing adultery, right? Whether it's outward, with, physically with somebody, or whether it's in, your, in, in the play of your mind. That's why Jesus says if you lust after a woman or a man, if you're a woman, it's just like you've committed adultery. It can be in the mind as well as outward. But you don't have to be told you're committing that. You know that. The problem with greed is... You don't realize that it's in you. And Jesus is saying, no, it's there. I love Tim Keller told a, a great story about this. He said he was going to do a series on the seven deadly sins. And his wife, Kathy, said to him, 
I'll bet your least attendance is, uh, is at the one on greed. So they won't come because they don't think they have it. And Keller says this, he says, yeah, he says I, I didn't really think that was right, but he said, she was right. She said, they said pride, oh, I do that. Lust, yeah. They even came for sloth, which amazed me, but not greed, why? Not because they were resentful, they just said, not me, moi, materialistic, not me. It hides from us, beloved, but it's there, it's there. Buried somewhere in our being is covetousness. So we must smoke it out. It's our responsibility to do that. We must begin to ask ourselves the questions that would smoke it out. Do I really need this or is it just a want? Will this really honor God as it is to honor me? Do I really need more? of this? Could I live more simply? Am I comparing with other people? Am I thinking about others more than I'm thinking about myself? Is this what God wants me to do with his money? Because at the end of the day, it's his money. You're just a steward. And one day we're all going to give account for what we did with that, right? So we need to ask these questions to begin to smoke this out. Jesus gives this perspective. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He uses the word zoe, zoe for life there, zoe. He could use bios, which would mean biological life, but he doesn't, he uses zoe, which means kind of the essence of life, what, what is real. And he's saying, this may appear to be real, but it's not. Things appear to be real, but they're not. Things are tangible, but they're not going to last forever. They're not the abundance of life, even though you may think so. You would think so to watch us. The more the better, Jesus warns. It's way too short-sighted. We can enjoy what God gives us. We should enjoy what God gives us. But beloved, if it's more important than him, if we would hold back what he asks us to give somewhere else, what he asks us to give for the sake of others, what he asks us to give to his work, we who are the most richest people in the history of the world. I know this is a tough sermon. At the very week, I'm telling you how thankful I am for what you're giving to the building committee and its fund, and it's way above what you would ever expect of a congregation this size. And so hopefully this doesn't apply to too many of us. But to the extent it does, beloved, we gotta be listening, right? Things will not last forever. I love, they have a short shelf life. I love how Mark Twain said this. He said, he said civilization, he said civilization, but it could just as well apply to all of our lives. Civilization is a limit, limitless multiplication of unnecessary necessities. That's what takes up most of our lives, unnecessary necessities. We call it necessary, so it makes it okay. But the fact is, it's an unnecessary necessity. We've turned it into something that it's really not. I, I love how Randy Alcorn illustrates this in The Treasure Principle. He says, suppose you're, you're driving down the street and you see a bunch of pickups. And in the back of these pickups, there's, a, you know, there's all kinds of things loaded in them. There's a bunch of computers, there's appliances, there's furniture, and they're, they're all going down the street. And you notice they pull into a parking lot. So you pull in after them to see what's going on. And you see everybody unloading their pickup. But then you notice they're not just unloading and stacking it on the Cement, they're throwing it over a cliff. And you look over and you find out, oh, I'm in a landfill. I'm in a junkyard. And his point is, that's where everything is going to end up. All the possessions. They're all going to end up one day in the junkyard. That's where they're all going because things, whatever they are, have a short shelf life. And to live for them craziness, right? All the birthday presents, all the Christmas presents, all the Father's Day presents, all the, thank you, all the, they're all going to end up there, right? They're all going to end up there. We can appreciate them, we can enjoy them, but beloved, don't make them your life. All ends up in the dump, every single piece. People are forever. 
things are short-lived. So where should our attention be? That's the instruction. How about the illustration? The illustration, verses 16 through 20. It's the story we just read, the parable about this rich man. He's been saving for years, and now he's got more than he knows what to do with, and he decides, what am I going to do with it? Well, I know. I'll tear down my old barns. I'll build, I'll build bigger ones. And when I get it all safely tucked away, I'll say to myself, listen, you've earned this. Enjoy yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have a great time. This is his retirement plan. Save up as much as you can for 60 years, and then live it up for the next 20 It's, frankly, the retirement plan of most Americans. Save all you can for 60 years or 65 and then live it up for the next 15 or 20. It's the 60-20 plan. We all live on it. We can't hardly criticize it because that's who we are. But what does God think of the plan? He answers in one word, one word, fool. You fool. You fool. This is the only place in the Bible where God directly calls somebody a fool. Now, Jesus in Matthew 23, 17 calls the Pharisees as a group fools. So it's not like there's only one in the Bible. But this is the only place where God directly says to somebody, you're a fool. He didn't think much of his 60-20 plan. Now, beloved, I'm not saying you shouldn't save up for retirement. Please don't go away from here and say that. You know, all kinds of passages in the Old Testament talk about go to the ant, you sluggard, you know, figure out what he does, see how he saves in the summer for the winter and he makes provision. We should do all of those things. But it must not be the thing that most characterizes our existence. It must not be the thing around which our existence centers. There's, there, there's, there's three things that I see here that are wrong with this guy's 60-20 plan. So let me identify those for you because I, hopefully this will help you see what's the difference between having a legitimate concern about my retirement or concern about how I can use the things that God gives me before then. But what would make them wrong? What would make me a fool in God's eyes? Here's the three things. Number one, his plan was self-centered rather than other-centered. It was self-centered rather than other-centered. How did Jesus summarize all the requirements that are in the law? If you want to, you know, skip Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and, you know, you don't like those because it's just tough reading. Okay, let me give you the summary. What's the summary? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, right? And what's the rest of it? to love your neighbor as yourself. That was not in this guy's 60-20 plan. When he looked at all the excess that he had, what was it? Well, I think, I, man, I got plenty. I give to somebody else. Didn't even enter his mind, right? What's he going to do? I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store it all up for me. He had no thought. I mean, he's ready for the payoff. He's been working his 60 years. He's ready for the payoff. There's no thought of sharing the excess. He had a very common philosophy. His philosophy was, I earned it, I'm going to spend it. God had nothing to do with it. I worked hard for everything I got. That's fallacy number one. I think if God could speak to that out loud, and which is what he's doing here in writing, what he would say is, you earned it? Seriously? Who, um, who was it that gave you the health that allows you to go out and do the work that allows you to earn this excess? Who, who did that? Who was it that gave you the special skills and abilities that allowed you to go out and earn your living in whatever way you did and it resulted in all this excess? Who, who, who was that? Instead of being like somebody else who didn't get to that point. Who was it that caused the seed to grow when you put it in the ground? 
Who was it that caused the weather to cooperate? Or the market fluctuations to be just right so that you could get this great increase? And who was it that created a thousand other things that are outside of your control that allows you to be in this position? Who gave you life to begin with? You want to leave God out of the picture? Don't do that, beloved. All any of us have done is maximize, if we've done that even, the gifts that he's already given us. And he's been very clear in his word. He didn't give us these gifts so that we could spend them all on ourselves. We are gifted to give, not to get. Say, where do you get that? All over the Bible, (laughs) right? All over the place. Let me read a few. Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him rather labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he can put it away for retirement and not be a burden on society. Is that what it says? Well, no, it's not. I know you're not looking at that verse. Here's what it says. It says, let him work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. God's not against preparing for retirement, but it must be in the context of helping others who are not so fortunate. He says in Proverbs 21, 26, all day long he, the sluggard, craves and craves, but the righteous gives gives and does not hold back. 1 John 3, 17, but if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? I know how many of us avoid that verse. We just don't look to see our brother in need, right? But God will hold us accountable. Here's the, here's the example of all examples. God gives us so we can share, just like his own son, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor, so that we, we through his poverty, might become rich. That's the example. That's the model. The fact that Jesus came and gave his life and died on the cross and did all of this for us, that's the example. This man had nothing like that in his mind. The last thing on his mind was to share anything. He was selfish to the core. But selfish people are foolish people. Selfish people are foolish people. J. Vernon McGee. It's kind of a funny little deal. I don't know whether he made this up or found it somewhere. I'm guessing he found it somewhere, but he had a little poem about this. Well, like this, it said, I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests and all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches, while I drank up the tea. It was also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. Could that possibly define who we are? Boy, what a tragedy that would be, wouldn't it? It'd be a tragedy. We might slip in a sandwich to somebody now and then, you know, a couple dollars in the plate occasionally, salve our conscience, but what are we really living for? What are we living for? God is asking us to be other-centered rather than self-centered. You know what the amazing thing is? That when we are other-centered more than self-centered, And I'm thankful for a wife who helps me do that better than I could ever do it on my own. And some of you may have a husband or wife who helps you with that, or a friend or someone else. You get way more than you ever give because you can't outgive God. You can't. I mean, I can can speak to that from my own life's experience and from the life experience of hundreds of other people. You can never outgive God. So he was, with this man, this man was self-centered instead of other-centered. Secondly, he was earth-centered, not heaven-centered. He was earth-centered, not heaven-centered. Remember that Colossians 3, 5, where it says, don't be, you know, get yourself out of this earthly mode. That's where this man was. His every effort was to build up his worldly portfolio. He had no thought for laying up treasure in heaven. 
No thought of that. That didn't enter his mind. He lived like this life is all there is. And you know, think about it. If that's true, then his plans made sense, right? If this life is all there is, how can you criticize him? Work for, for, for 60 and party for 20? And maybe a little bit of partying during the 60? That's not all bad. Be a good way to go. You only go around once, so get all the gusto you can, right? If this is true, if this is true, if this is all there is, we might as well sing with Peggy Lee, right? If that's all there is, if that's all there is, if that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. Did you love that song? I never cared for that song because I thought she was wrong. And you know what Jesus is saying? She was wrong. She didn't have it right. What if that's not all there is? What if the Bible is right? What if Jesus is right? What if the voice that speaks inside you all the time that is saying this can't be all there is, what if that's right? Then what? What if there is more? What if this life isn't all there is? And what if what we do in this life does have a, an effect in the next life? There are consequences that an earth-centered lifestyle that doesn't see beyond the age of 80 doesn't look very smart, does it? If things end, but people last forever, then relax, eat, drink, and be merry isn't really all that brilliant, is it? It isn't. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. And who's the one person who's ever lived on earth that's already been in eternity and then come to give us a message and then gone back again. It's only Jesus. He's speaking from what he knows to be true. Death isn't the end, and man's, this man's plan looks foolish. I tell you what, it looks foolish even if his soul hadn't been required of him that night, right? Even if he got his 20 years, it would have still looked foolish. He would have still put every effort that he had into pleasing himself for the next 15 or 20 years, and then he had billions of years of existence to go and no preparation whatsoever. That's just plain stupid, Right? Kind of like the young man who was just, you know, at the start of his career. He was just beginning and an older friend, a mentor came along and he, he said to him, what are you going to do? And the man replied, well, I, I, I'm going to go to school and learn, learn my trade. He said, and then? He said, well, after that, I'm, I'm going to go out and ply my trade and earn my money and make my fortune. The older man said, and then? He said, well, you know, after I've done that, I, I, I'm sure I'll get too old to work. I'll, I'll retire and I'll enjoy, my, I'll enjoy my, my money, live on my money. He said, and then? He said, well, I suppose someday I'll die. And then? That's the question, isn't it? And then? If eternity is real, that's the question. And then? And the Bible answers that question. Hebrews 9, 27, what does the Lord say? It is appointed unto man once to die, and then what? And then the judgment, the accountability. First of all, for your life, was your life given to Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian? Were you a believer? Did you ever come to faith in Christ so that your eternal destiny in heaven or hell is settled? That's the first question. But if that question is positive, then the question is, how did you live your life? Was it wasteful? Was it all on you? Or was it for God and others? because eternal consequences attach to that. Beginning to see why God, through Jesus, calls this man a fool. But let me give you the last one. He was actuarially oriented, not God-oriented. What do actuaries do? Well, it's a it's kind of a big word, but what do actuaries do? Actuaries tell you how long you're going to live, on average, right? Among other things. They've got a lot of things that they do, but that's one of the things they do. 
this man assumed that he would get his full actuarial allotment, right? The 60-20 plan. The 60-20 plan doesn't make any sense if you don't get your full actuarial allotment. The problem is, here's the crushing blow that he experiences. It turns out it's not the actuary who determines how long we live. It's God. That's why the Lord says through David in Psalm 139, if, if this hasn't kind of sunk in, I mean, read it and reread it and read it again and read it again. It's a great psalm. And, and one of the most critical things in that psalm is that God says your days are numbered before you're ever born, before you ever come into life. Your days are numbered. By whom? By God. That's why you can honestly tell people, you know, when death comes, it doesn't matter how. It doesn't. Your days were numbered before you were ever born. The rest is just the means to the predetermined end. Your days are numbered. They're not numbered by the actuary, they're numbered by God. And God says to this man, not only do you not get your lucky 20, you don't even get one. You don't even get one year, you don't even get one day, because why? This night, this very night, <clears throat> your soul is required of you. End of life, beloved, is not a negotiation, right? It's not. It's a statistic determined by God. Actuaries can tell us what the average is going to be, but nobody, not one of us here today, is guaranteed the average. We don't know when the time is going to come. We have no idea what it's, that the average may tell us one thing, but we don't know when our time has come. Like this man, our time could come tonight. Then what will we do with all this stuff? Where will it all go? What will happen to it? Patty and I have reached the age and we're starting to look around the house and say, what's going to happen to this and who's going to want it? And we've pretty well determined nobody. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Nobody's going to want this stuff. We know where it's going. I should tell you something. So why don't we just keep piling it up? The actuary doesn't determine our lifespan. Targeting 20 years to party begins to look foolish when you realize, like, like this man, you may get nothing. He invested in the wrong place, didn't he? If he'd have best been invested in, in eternity, he'd have not only had it for the next 20 years, he'd have had it for the 20 years after that, and the 20 years after that, and the 20 years after that. I, you know, I think we don't really believe this. I, th I think we don't get it. I don't, I don't think we understand that we, when we invest in eternity, when we give our money to the Lord's work, with a, with, not with a grudging attitude, but with an enthusiastic attitude, not knowing how God's going to use it, but we just willingly open it up to him. And we give our time to the VBS and we think these little bodies are going to be there. And, you know, at least one or two of them are going to be squirrely and you know, we're not going to know what to do with them and it's, it's going to be a mess. And I mean, we're thinking, this is eternity, this can't be. But that's the message of the Bible. It is eternal. There can be eternal results that come from all of this. It does matter. And whether that poor little kid ever gets straightened out or not, it matters to you. Because your investment in time is being accounted for in heaven. How, how, how do we get this across? We need a bank book, you know? If we had a bank book, would that help? And maybe you ought to create one. My, my heavenly investment book. And write down in there, you know, the, the time you're spending, the money you're giving, whatever, and, 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 and just turn it over to God every once in a while and say, God, here it is. This, is. this is my investment in eternity. But it's real. It's as real as, it's, it's way more real than the bench we're sitting on. It's way more real than the things we're going to go home to today that are going to end up in the junk heap. Eternity is real. Investing in eternity is real. And this man had no concept of events of eventually in, of eternity. The, and the application of this is really easy, right? Every life hangs by a thread, every single one. We, we seem young and healthy, life hangs by a thread. We don't know when we're gonna hear this night, your life, your soul is required of you. We just know it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. This night, this night could be your night. This night could be my night. We don't know. 
when it's coming. So if we don't know, do you see why the 60-20 plan that only looks at this life is way short-sighted? If you don't know when your time is going to be, if you don't know what's the best thing you can do, assume that it will be tonight. Then you can't lose. Assume that it's going to be tonight. That's why Moses said in Psalm 90, verse 12, so number your days. It didn't mean that you were going to know the number, but he's saying account for the fact that your life has a number attached to it and live like that. Assume that it's going to be tonight. You can be a fool and trust the actuary, or you can be a wise person and trust God. It's your choice. But remember, God is the one who will eventually say, tonight your, night is, your soul is required of you, not the actuary. You thought your life was yours to do with as you want, but God's may, saying tonight may be your night. I love this story for a lot of reasons, but it illustrates the point. It's the main reason. The lady goes in, she has just gotten a new government job, right? government job. So she needed proof of citizenship. So she goes in, she meets with the HR person on the first day of work, and she takes along her driver's license and her birth certificate for proof of citizenship. And the HR clerk looks at the driver's license, copies off a bunch of information, right? And then she picks up the birth certificate. And she looks at it, takes off a little information, and she continues to stare at it. And the lady who's come in to get the job says, what's, what's, what's wrong? Is there, some, is there something wrong with my birth certificate? And she says, well, I can't find an expiration date. <laughs> now remember, this is a government job. <laughs> Folks, okay. I can't find your expiration date. Here's a news flash. Birth certificates don't come with an expiration date, right? Not in, not in from an earthly standpoint, but God knows when the expiration date is, see? God knows. And there is an expiration date on every birth certificate in God's hands. It could be today. Listen, listen. It's a little before 12.30 p.m., November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy lifted his hand, waved at Charles Brehm and his family standing at the side of the motorcade in Dallas. The actuaries said, He had 30 more years to live. Five seconds later, Clint Hill was looking down into such a massive wound in the president's head that he knew he was already gone. He was young, he was strong, he had every thought that he could live live at least most of that 30 years. He didn't get another second. You say, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not in the public eye. I don't have people taking pot chats at me. Listen, your life is just as tenuous as his was. All of our lives are. There's no guarantee. Life is short, beloved. We need to live as though tonight can be our night. We need to be ready. Final point, just briefly, the insight in verse 21, the insight Jesus says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Your choice is to be rich toward yourself or to be rich toward God. That's the insight. And what he's urging is be rich toward God. Spend yourself on things that have eternal value. Everything that you buy here, everything that you possess here, every relationship even that you have here has has an expiration date. Only the things of God have no expiration date. So wise people give themselves and their resources to the Lord's work for the benefit of others, trusting that in his time and in his way, God will use these and multiply them and give them eternal worth. That's how wise people live. Let me conclude with one more story. A wife goes away on a business trip, right? And she calls home, all excited. He says to her husband, he says, how's the trip going? She says, oh, great, great. He says, but you, you won't guess what I've done. He says, what? She says, I've redecorated my hotel room. He says, you have done what? 
She says, I redecorated my hotel room. She says, it's beautiful. I, w- I wish you could see it. It's wonderful. She says, what, what did you do? She said, well, I, had a, I took the old carpet out. I had them bring in new carpet, painted the walls. I redid the bathroom. You love the bathroom. It's great. He says, how much did all of that cost you? She says, honey, $10,000. I found a local guy. It was not $10,000 is all it cost me. He says, you're only going to be there three days. He says, I, she says, I know, but I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here. He says, it's crazy. It is crazy. When I redecorate a hotel room, I just want to get the air turned on, right? <laughs> Which the air conditioning would work. But that's what it's like to live as though life is stuff. Life is not stuff. Life is a relationship with God and a willingness to give for others so that when, when the message comes to us, this night your soul is required of you, we're ready. We've realized all along we're just passing through. And so now we're ready to go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, this is a, it's a challenge to all of us, different ways in every life different ways in every life, but Lord, I, I know that covetousness lurks in all, of our, in all of our lives, in all of our homes, in all of our desires, praying that we will have those submitted to you, not that you don't want us to enjoy the things that you give. You do. Lord, we see it throughout the Bible. We see rich people who have their ducks in line. They worship you and serve you first continue to enjoy the things you give them, but it's almost like the more they give, the more they enjoy, the more you give them to give. And wow, what a, what a great thing when you can trust us with money, when you can trust us with possessions, when you can trust us, period. Because we're living as though tonight could be the night. Help us to realize that's the reality. And we will thank you and praise you with the way we live in Jesus' name. Amen.